My topic today is rational pricing. I don't know what rational pricing means, but we'll, we'll try and handle it and draw all generics. But I also want to bring in some science into this discussion, not just talk about, about pricing and generics. And I think it's important to, first, I should really thank Charles for inviting me for the second time in a row to this meeting. I'm very grateful to come to Canada again, uh, especially on, a, on a, the weather's been pretty good here compared to uh, even Atlanta. So I'm really happy to be here. And I think I want to go quickly through some of the background before I move into the major topic here. And I'd like to also dedicate this talk to my good friend from Australia, if I may, Steve Locarnini, because I think yesterday he thinks that we're finished. So I'm going to take the debate on and tell you that we're not finished. And hopefully he will agree with me at the end of the talk, but we'll see. That's why I'm dedicated to him, so he can't really turn it down. So uh, Steve, pay attention, take some good pictures. I'll give you my slides afterwards if you wish. Uh, so really, let's go through the discovery to cure. And it's a really fantastic story, very quickly. Uh, I think you all know the story, but it's amazing what we have been able to do, the people in this room as out and outside this room, and people attending the ASLD uh, in less than 25 years. It's from discovery to, tr to cure. That's the most efficient, uh, this, uh, efficient process that I've ever seen. In fact, even drugs like interferon were available within three years after uh, uh, discovery of the, of the hepatitis C virus, which was called before uh, non-A, non-B. But really, it's, uh, there are a lot of champions. These are some of the champions, uh, but also people like Rolf Butterschlager and Charlie Rice and others who really developed the replicon system, which really propelled the dis discovery of new drugs for hepatitis C and really transformed this, this industry into something that is uh, amazing. Uh, amazing results. And we all know the story, the 25 years of HV genotype 1 therapy going from 0 to 100, sounds like a Bugatti, going very, very fast. Uh, it's quite remarkable. And today, uh, we're talking about 94 to 96 percent SVR12. That's what the bar is, and hopefully, and probably could be 100 percent, really, in a lot of cases. And if patients came back to the treat to the clinic, as Manal said, a lot of the patients don't come back for, for for to see they feel good and they don't bother coming back. So that's why we have intent to treat analysis and that's one of the reasons why we don't get 100% all the time. But the drugs are really fabulous and they work very well. And you know, 12 weeks, 24 weeks looks great. And we, people may say we don't need to go shorter uh, and they will talk about that a lot today. So the success is really and the challenges to HCV cure have been basically eliminating interferon from the, uh, from the armamentum that we have. Riba, we've seen some data yesterday, perhaps for some people it will be needed, at least for a couple of years going forward, two to three years. Uh, Contraindication to treatment are relatively rare, but remain challenged. This is including severe cases of cirrhosis. And we've seen also now, we're beginning to see more people being cured with the drugs, but unfortunately their cancer becomes more fulminant and that's something to be concerned about. And that also brings the issue of treating early. Like we've made the same mistakes with HIV where we uh, only had, we, we had we initially we treated patients who had 300 copies per ml. And then now we realize that we probably made a huge mistake which are treating people earlier. And, uh, and now, of course, we're doing it, but it may be a bit too late for a lot of people who suffered from this, amazing, from this horrible disease. Short duration, as Manal said, may be highly advantageous in the real world, especially in places like Egypt. Uh, increased adherence, lower toxicity, decreased cost. Possible drug resistance is eliminated, especially if people start talking about generics and contraband type of drugs. That's uh, being misused. You're going to get a lot more resistance, I predict. And um, the compromise in efficacy is acceptable when retreatment options are effective and readily available. And I think we do have a lot of different classes of drugs now. We'll get more as time goes on. Another reason why we should develop additional classes of compounds, and I'll talk about that briefly. So global access to low-cost HCV treatment is the primary unmet challenge. It really is the elephant in the room today. Shorter treatment will make a difference, especially in underdeveloped countries. And this slide I borrowed from Mark Zukowski, which 
talks about simplicity and short. These are the two key words, keep it simple and keep it short. Simple in terms of high HCV cure rate for most genotypes, minimal monitoring, short, I mean by minimizing side effects, improve adherence and persistence, lower cost, fewer healthcare resources required, more HCV cure per health. And you must, you heard from Manal, for example, that they don't do uh, scans anymore, fiber scans and things like that they do for some patients. That takes time and effort. And if you had shorter treatment, like four weeks treatment, you could see 13 patients per year. Uh, for, uh, you know, if you had six weeks, you can basically see, look at nine patients. And if you have 12, uh, four patients per year. So clearly, a shorter treatment, you can see many more patients per year for each doctor that's available. In fact, if you look at places like uh, Mark's place at Johns Hopkins, is maxed out. You can't see any more. You're seeing maybe a thousand patients a year with the current treatment that you have. You can't even treat many more that he could. He could treat many more, but he doesn't have the resources and the people to be able to treat even with the nice DAA drugs that we have. Now we've been very fortunate because the drug industry and academia working together have come up with some amazing drugs, especially the NS5B. We only have one approved, but hopefully more will come along not only nukes, but also pangenotypic non-nukes, which will come on the horizon. NS5A, just about every company, everybody has an NS5A inhibitor, relatively easy to make, but we'll talk about that too. And of course, the protease inhibitor. And compounds like uh, feldeprevir, we mentioned yesterday, as a comeback, there's actually an ongoing study right now with feldeprevir with an with a NS5A inhibitor, and this results will come out next year, early next year, to see if this combination could be used in uh, low to middle income. Uh, countries. We've also seen tremendous progress with our US FDA and EMEA in terms of drug approvals, with of course in December 2013 the approval of both Simaprevil, Simaprevil and Sofosvir, September 2014 the Glasivir in Europe and Japan, uh, and more recently in the US, uh, October 2015 Lab led which is basically Harvoni, uh, the first uh, uh, fixed dose combination of drugs used for the treatment of HCV. Uh, the Vicera pack also was approved in December 2014, which is four or five drugs uh, together, and the Harvoni in Japan, and then the class of A4 gene attack 3, and now in July of this year we had uh, Technivi. It is clear that um, the nukes will continue to be important part of the treatment, for, for now at least, because they have high potency, no drug-drug interaction, pangenotypic, high barrier to resistance, and low pill burden or viability. About a year ago, we published a paper in Liver International, where we talked about the first generation PI, the second generation PI, the first generation NS5A and NS5B, and you can see the, the green is the good profile, the yellow is average, and red is less uh, favorable. You can see the nukes have all, when you look at efficacy, resistance profile, pangenotypic efficacy, adverse events, and drug-drug interactions. Clearly, these are the best, uh, the best compounds, but certainly the NS5A are coming, coming fairly f fast, and even some protease inhibitors, a lot more green, as you can see, than there were a couple of years ago. And I believe with time, you're going to see a lot more green on this table. In the old days, potency, genotype coverage, resistant barrier, and safety interoperability was the highest importance. And then following was the treatment duration, half-life of the drugs, the pill burden, drug-drug interaction, of course, the cost. But I think now the conversation has changed, and cost has become sort of the elephant in the room, and everybody talks about it and forget how useful these drugs are. And clearly, uh, that's, a, that's on our mind because uh, it's basically bankrupting a lot of uh, countries and a lot of uh, medical health systems. And we'll have more discussion about that later. Fortunately, companies like Gilead and other companies now are, have signed agreements with 11 Indian companies to manufacture generic HCV medicine in more than 90 countries. And they, they hope by doing this, they will provide access to HCV drugs to 7 million, people, uh, 7 million people living with HCV. And the price of uh, generic Sovaldi, this is a generic license Sovaldi, 
for this country is about $567. And even for a full 12-week treatment, assuming they don't go further than that. And forget that, don't forget also that we'll need a second drug to make this treatment uh, potent and effective. So the cost may be higher. And even just Savaldi, that represents about 20% of the average annual income in India. So clearly, prices will need to come down further. And the only way to do that is by shortening the duration of treatment, I believe. And again, making my argument why we do need shorter treatments. We've seen the newspapers, like Bloomberg Business, saying one pill a day, 12 weeks, $94,000. $500. I don't believe actually anybody pays that price. I really don't believe it. I don't think anybody has paid the full price for this drug from day one. This is probably the, uh, the price that uh, the press unfortunately hangs on to this number, but I, today nobody, nobody on the, in the planet actually pays that full price. But nevertheless, it's still very, very high. Uh, and because of the high price, it's effect, adversely affecting treatment access and drug compliance. And it also, unfortunately, encourages drug counterfeiting, which is not just generic, it's counterfeiting drugs, which could create substantial public health hazard and cause safety concerns. So this is something we all have to keep in mind. There are generics, which are legal, and there are counterfeit generics as well. So please, there is a big difference there. Now, if you look at the, car, the price, now we're gonna talk about price, and again, Jordan covered a lot of what I was going to say yesterday, but this is some new slides that I fortunately got from Manal, uh, from a group, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, who have a paper in Lancet uh, titled Disparity in Market Prices for HCV Direct Acting Antiviral Agents. And I hope you can see this, it's a bit tight, uh, but you look on the y-axis, the uh, GDP, the gross uh, national income, you know, log scale and the price in US dollars, today's US dollars. And of course, you can see countries like the US up here with a high GDP in Switzerland. And these are for the drugs that are currently available, Simaprovir, Lipesvir, Sfosovir, and Taclasovir, and the 2D combo. And you can see that they, this, the prices are quite different in Switzerland compared for, for example, so Harvoni versus the price in the United States. For the Harvoni, this is for one single bottle of 28 pills. So there are even discrepancies among high income countries, significant income. Even in Germany, as you can see, Germany is one here, and compare, and, and Germany, other drugs, there are discrepancies too in the type of drugs that are available. Harvoni versus some other, some of the, of the drugs, the prices are significantly different. France, big spread, UK, maybe a bit less of a spread. Italy, Spain, South Korea, uh, supposed to be uh, rich countries. So I, don't think, I don't think Spain is really that rich, but anyway, um, maybe Greece falls into place there too. And Italy is certainly not, uh, not that rich anymore. Uh, but clearly, you can see the prices vary significantly from South Korea. Uh, one drug is less than $5,000 and another uh, uh, drug is over uh, 30, 20, $24,000, $23,000. So that's quite a, a big difference. The difference is not that big when you talk about low and middle income countries. They all gather here. I don't know if Brazil, Brazil now I suppose is a low income countries. The currency is devalued by half and they have problems, uh, but the drugs, almost all of them fall here. There are outliers with Turkey uh, being one of the outliers where they pay a lot more money than the other countries. And there's also uh, Cote d'Ivoire, for example. You can see that the, uh, the, the levels here of the, draw, of the price a bit different from some of the countries like South Africa, big disparity for the same, for relatively the same price. So this was done actually by Médecins Sans Frontières and the major reason why they did this is because they actually want to start treating HCV positive into individuals in at least nine countries. Uh, therefore, there is, and there is a need for affordable access to DAA. Also, I recently found out that one of the few countries in the world, Australia, my friend Locornini, allows people to bring in generic importation of drugs. You try and uh, send uh, Sovaldi from France to U.S., for example, which, where France is a bit cheaper than the U.S. Uh, IH, uh, basically, FedEx 
DHL and all these companies will never take these drugs forward unless you have a permit from the government. They will return the drugs to you. So it's not going to work. You have to actually go physically and pick up the drugs from somewhere and bring it back to Australia or bring it back to the United States. So that's one of the problems that we have. So generic, generic importation is at least legal in certain countries, Australia being one of them. So I raise my hat to, to Australia where they can get the price down significantly. And in general, when you talk about generics, there are arguments for and there are arguments against. And again, there's very little literature on HCV generic. There's actually none. <laughs> I couldn't find anything. But in general, generics in the United States account for about 78% of all US prescription. So that's where the companies make their money uh, on generics. Uh, and even the generics sometimes are quite highly priced. Uh, there are other things in Canada. Ontario Drug Benefit uh, Program reports 88% Generics disperse within two months of availability, so it's very fast the moment the drug becomes generic. It's approved very, very quickly. Um, basically, to get generics, it's the same FDA approval. It's a long way. Unfortunately, it takes about, in the United States, three years to approve a generic, whereas if you have a new drug, it can take one, and, one to one and a half years. So it takes a lot longer to get approval in the United States, unfortunately, for generics than it is for uh, novel, novel innovative drugs like Sovaldi. According to the Canadian Family Physicians Review, generic medications are bioequivalent and produce similar clinical outcomes to brand names medication. That's at least in Canada. I don't know if that's true also in India or Bangladesh or Pakistan. Numerous reports of equivalent efficacy and safety of generic compared to brand for other life-threatening conditions. Adherence rates report are maintained, and this is uh, the last bullet I added for HCV what I call non-incestuous fixed dose combinations can be manufacturers. For example, Daxof. Uh, as one example, you can actually make one single pill of Daxof, which you can't do, you can't make in the United States. So there are convenient, sometimes there are conveniences uh, of bringing non-incestuous combination together from Bristol and from Gilead. So this is the way to go. The arguments against, and you'll hear them, the different shape, the color, the taste, the name, can lead to patient and even doctor confusion. Confusion to, can lead, lead to uh, reduced adherence. Generics can contain different fillers, which may not be tolerated. In Egypt, there are generics, uh, illegal as well as illegal ones, that are, there's no quality assurance. The government hasn't put into place any assurances that the quality is good enough for human consumption. These drugs are just made. We don't even know where they're made. Sometimes they're made in Laos. Sometimes they're made in China. Uh, sometimes in Bangladesh, probably in a garage somewhere. So you really need to worry about how these drugs are made. There's really no quality assurance. The government have taken no steps whatsoever to guarantee the quality, even of the generics or even counterfeit drugs. Metal levels is always a concern. Can be high, higher leading to mental illness and mental headaches and so on more headaches with these drugs, but fortunately it's short-term treatment. There are subtle differences in bioavailability, may limit optimal treatment. And as in Egypt, and as well as other countries, they go to the pharmacy and get the phosphovir, or they get whatever they get, the clasivir, but they don't even know how to use it. So there's a lot of misuse. How long should we treat? Are they treating the right genotype? Uh, how, many, how many days should, what combination should they be using? There's a lot of uh, misinformation which can lead to resistance, significant resistance, especially if the, the drugs are NS5A inhibitors, uh, which could cause immense problem later on. And these are some of the counterfeit drugs that I was able to look, uh, found. And there's actually counterfeit versus generic DA. This is some of the counterfeit. This one, for example, is called, you can see it is called Sofeni. It's actually made in La La Laos, but there's no, uh, no indication anything on the box, there's no expiration date, there's nothing. And the class of air, the, the class of air was just the Taktami, or whatever it's called. Uh, this is another generic. Uh, Sovaldi, this is the color. They're, fortunately, they color them differently, as you can see. They have a red, this is Sovaldi, for example, generic so Sovaldi. And you have counterfeit up here, as well as generic. This is DAC. The, the green little pills are DAC pills. They're pretty good quality, actually. I tested them in my lab. 
And I recently found that in, uh, in uh, Brazil, they actually manufacture Harvoni. So <laughs> they actually make a fixed dose combination uh, for export, not necessarily for, uh, for, for uh, local use. So it is important to remember that if the drugs were affordable, like marijuana, <laughs> in a way, and approved, illegal, in the first place, true counterfeit drugs would be profitable as an enterprise at all. So I think this is one thing we need to remember. If you bring the price down low enough, I think the counterfeits will go away and the generic will, may come up and uh, so on. Now we've seen the amazing results of these wonderful drugs, and this is some examples here with Genotype 1. And I'm not going to go into it because a lot of people have covered that already, but you can see the 100% on the right-hand side, uh, 99, 95, whatever. And even for genotype 3, we, you know, we always show these type of slides for genotype 3, but we're going to see a lot more of this type of slides at, at, the, AS, at the ASLD. With, uh, uh, this is a phase 2, but now we've got even phase 3. Even for genotype 3, we're getting high rates of 94%. And phase 3, we got more than close to 95 plus percent. Uh, and there are other studies, too, that demonstrate that we can tackle genotype 3. So genotype 3 is not really a problem anymore. I hear people talking about it still. It's old news. We, have, we really have great drugs for even genotype 3. And again, truncation of therapy, uh, coming back to Manal's point, is possible and is advantageous. And I mentioned why. These are some of the reasons. Adherence, decreased costs, less docs make curative treatment regimen more accessible, curtail the massive use of counterfeit medicine, which could be potentially harmful. The key is to use the most potent and safest DEA together. Unfortunately, none of the companies today have the best possible combinations. You think they do, but it takes 12 weeks. They've tried very hard to shorten duration. And plan scenario in case of failure, like we do for HIV, need markers for success. So the diagnostic people, we heard diagnostic people, they should really develop markers. When should we stop therapy? When is the patient cure without having to go through the 12 weeks of 24? And I think also response-guided therapy is going to be very important as time goes on, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So there have been st studies, as you all know, attempt to pan oral DAA four and six weeks, and they've been miserably fa miserable failures. There's the Adgain study with soft adipasvir riba. Uh, uh, the Gilead, some of the Gilead studies, there are three of them that I'm aware of with genotype 1 patients. Uh, you can see the success has not been that great, and also um, work by Cohill, for example, and as well as more recently, Lawitz with the, uh, with the triple combo from, Mer from MSD. That tells me that one of the drugs here, in my opinion, is not good. It's not that great. Well, there's maybe some drug-drug interaction. I don't know, but it's possible. Why do you get such low levels here and low level here? And you've got three powerful, supposedly powerful drugs, but these are all incestuous. This was not incestuous. It's soft in there. But something's wrong with one of these drugs. So we thought about a year ago actually two years ago, of doing our own study, not sponsored by any company, not sponsored by any company, because nobody else seems to want to do it. And we took some of the drugs that are currently available, approved by the FDA, and I'm going to give you a quick preview on what the late breaker that will be presented on Monday, November 16th. Here we use a response guided therapy, and we use triple oral direct acting antiviral agents for three weeks, forget about four weeks. I'm trying to I took the risk. And we use 1B patients. Now you're going to say it's unfair. It's very unfair. It's the easiest one to treat. But I'm going to start somewhere. Give me a chance. You know, I'm paying for the study. I'm going to get some positive results. And 1B strains account for 22% of all HCV infection globally. So it's not a small, trivial number of people. There's 170 plus million people infected. 20% represents a lot of people. So I'm not talking about something that is unfair. It's actually very fair, and it's something that people have to think about, and this could open up uh, to other uh, genotypes. But it's a good, it's a good start. We wanted to start. We used Chinese patients. The study was conducted in Hong Kong with George Lau. And we called it the SODAPI study. I think you can guess why. So, da, pi. So, you guess it. And here are some of the results very quickly. 
And I'm not going to go through in great details because we are presenting this next Monday. But we had 26 naive genotype 1 subjects. They had F0 to F3. Divide them three, three groups, a rapid, and here's the key. The response guided therapy, we set that up as the RVR2, two, day two. What happens on day two? So we, me we measure the viral load on day zero. We measure it on day two. And we set up a, bar a, bar a, a, a line up here, 500 international units per ml. This was actually the assay that was available in Hong Kong, the first easy assay. There is a more sensitive one, which is 25 international units per ml, but it's more costly. And so we define that, that if you, patients have an RVR2 of less than 500 international units per ml by day two, we can continue treatment for three weeks and then stop. And actually out of the 26, 18 persons had that characteristic. And the drugs that we use are very familiar to you. Sofosavir, Lipasvir, Sunepravir, Sofdac-Sim, Sofdac-Sunepravir. And the numbers here on day two, we had six out of 12, six out of six, and six out of eight. Then we follow them, the ones that, by the way, the ones that did not ha had a viral load greater than 500 international units at day two, we gave them Harvoni. That's all, just they're still part of the study, but we just gave them Harvoni, and they all, by the way, got cured. So, but we have to do for 12 weeks treatment. So, interestingly, at SVR12, for the th three-week treatment, all subjects, 100%, we got 100% cure rate in, a, uh, in the study. And as I said, no, the no, drug was not funded by pharma. So we've done a lot of planning for the study and actually collected a lot of samples. We haven't analyzed them all. Uh, we have done all the virology part. Uh, there are many other things we need to do. But this is, we get baseline samples, we get virus load, we got the viral kinetics from zero to 48 hours. We, this is what we measure, HCV RNA obviously, the genotype, all of them on one A. And we do fiber scan, ultrasound, blah, blah, blah. So everything else is done and again, we stop treatment at day 21. We follow all the way to 12 weeks. Actually, we've gone even further than that. And this is actually shows you the graph for the three different combo, group one, group two, and group three. And the initial response was this. Here you can see the initial of day two, day four, day seven. This is looking at percent of patients with HCV RNA less than the limit of quantitation, which is 25 international units per ml. So we've gone a bit higher, the bar is set higher. And you can see even at week two, two of the groups were 100% cured, undetectable, I should say, not cured, and 83% in the soft TAC asunepravir. And then by, day, by week three, 100% across the board. Four weeks follow up, 100%, 12 weeks follow up, 100%. So you can see it's possible to do these studies. We did it with genotype 1B. One, one Maybe it's possible with other genotypes. And of course, I needn't tell you, very simply, you can do the maths in your head, 12 weeks versus three weeks. You're talking about a fourfold, fourfold savings of drugs. Of course, you have to add a protease inhibitor, the slight cost there involved. But they're all three different companies. The drugs are all three different companies, or two companies plus one company. We've done cost-effective analysis, and this is using the assumed retail price. So this is not discounted price, the full retail price and for the United States, I'm sorry, not Canada. But you can see uh, we've done decision analytical Markov model, blah, blah, blah. And you can see that the cost, the cost saving is over $100,000 compared to 181 for the treatment. So 74,000, half, more than half. For this particular combination, DAC, SOF, SIM. Uh, SOF plus DAC plus Osunaprovir. Again, tremendous savings, three weeks versus the full course, and again, uh, soft, lidipasvir, asunapravir, tremendous saving to half price. Uh, this is full price, of the, compared to full price. So clearly, uh, in this proof of concept, it's a small study, small number of patients, but when you get 100%, you don't really need statistics. It wasn't one, it wasn't a patient of group one, it was six patients, at least, per group. So we do have that. non serotic uh, they're non-serotic genotype one. We had great, uh, good, excellent tolerability, of course. Uh, RVR uh, was achieved. 
uh, with a great majority of the patients, an SVR was uh, achieved at uh, 12 weeks. Um, I'm not going to go into the viral dynamics and viral kinetics, but I think everything that's been published on that is wrong. I'm just telling you. And uh, Alan Perelson is part of the study, just by the way. So <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And further studies investigate short duration of treatment are warranted, clearly. I mean, I think this is something that we need to spend the next two years, and I hope the drug companies will get involved in this, uh, in this type of work. So let me just say the f funding was basically from the Humanity and Health Medical Group, my group, Alan Perelson group. Uh, we didn't get any NIH funding, but uh, they pay our salaries. Some of, some of the groups here, the US government pays my, part of my salary and Alan's salary, but we didn't get any funding for this study from them other than our salary. And we did buy the drugs ourselves, uh, legally. And so I want to just, uh, and they were not generics, they were real, the real, the real McCoy for all this work. So again, another point is that as of last month, only about 600,000 individuals have been cured of HCV worldwide with DAA. And I think the problem, despite what you hear, will persist probably till 2036, at least in the US. The rest of the world may take longer. You're not going to be able to treat a million patients in one year. Uh, maybe, maybe next year we will be able to do that, but it's even then, we still have a, a large uh, way to go. The Sedapi approach could be applied in China almost immediately if we do a bigger study to demonstrate that it's feasible, uh, where you can save millions and millions of dollars and save many, 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 many lives. There's 40 million people are infected. They're not, they may not be the most, uh, uh, Egypt is number one in the world in terms of infection rate, but China has the greatest number of people infected with HCV. And Mongolia has genotype, a lot of countries have genotype 1B, Japan. And I think also, in terms of discovery, I think we do need to discover additional compounds because eventually we'll need backups and we have ways to overcome the problems. If we, especially if we start to use three drugs, we'll have to find another one or two more classes of compounds. And actually we're developing a helicase inhibitor, for example, uh, it's going through the mills. We have a pangenotypic NS5A inhibitor that's not, that's, a, that's a, uh, NS5, pangenotypic NS5B and an I, which is a rare thing. There's only two other companies that have a pangenotypic and, a, and an I. So all these things can be eventually be put into one regimen, and hopefully uh, this will work. So the way I see the world now, having been successful with 1B, is that we are now going from what I call the ZPAC to the CPAC. You know, I think most of you physicians are familiar with, with uh, Zithromax, two, two pills, uh, quite expensive, by the way. Uh, last time I paid in Mexico, it was something like $25 for a bottle, for, a, for one, one, one little uh, box. You only take the drugs for one or two days, and it supposedly cures you. So we do have curative therapies for antibacterial infections. We don't have for viral disease, rapid ones. This is probably the first one. So maybe we'll have a CPAC. Maybe it should be called Shinazivir or, or, or Rocarnivir or something like that. But it will be a, 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 new, a new drug. So with that, I'd like to stop and thank you very much and tell my friend who's left the room now, uh, the best is yet to come and the game is not over. Thank you very much.